This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I greet you today in the wonderful and precious name of Jesus. Let's turn our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to read from verse 1 to 11. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say, peace, peace, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. As labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light, sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as the helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. I want to thank the Lord today for this wonderful privilege. Of course, it always is a privilege to be able to share the good news of the gospel. And, you know, I'm just reflecting on what's happening. And it's, these words uh, just keep echoing in my mind, looking at the present situation, looking at where we are, looking at the fulfillment of prophecy, looking at what God has said in his word concerning the times we're in. These words are challenging me, which I'd like to challenge you with today. Are you ready? Are you ready? You know, just uh, yesterday, as, uh, or should I say on Friday, as we gathered for our early morning prayer meeting, um, in the early hours of the morning, I prepared the night before because I really felt that I was going to lead in prayer from the book of Exodus and just in the chapters that we're up to right now in our Bible reading, just to go uh, through those chapters and take the prayer points out of that so that we could address and pray through what God is, has been saying to us through his word. But you know, it was just after four o'clock in the morning as I was down uh, praying and getting ready uh, for come, coming up to the church for prayer, suddenly I just heard these words. Come against the spirit of death. Come against the spirit of death. Now, I had already prepared and gone through and just had spent even the hours of the night before uh, just prepared to just be able to go and pray God's word from Exodus. But I knew straight away on that basis that it was a clear, direct call. And oftentimes in our time of preparation in the word, we can be, we can, uh, be preparing to lead and just want to hear from God. And sometimes that's God preparing us. And, and after we've come through that process, he says something else uh, and uh, just to, to get us to that point where we need to be. So I prepared scriptures about coming against the spirit of death and some declarations. Now, we gather here, and those who are on Zoom here and abroad, we gather at 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. And on Friday morning, as we were gathering and we began to deal with this situation and come against the spirit of death that's coming uh, on, our, on our land and over the people in our country and around the world, you know, we, were, we finished our prayer meeting at 7 a.m. I would never have known this, but I thank God for his Holy Spirit and his word that are lamp to our feet 
light to our path, guides us, lead us into a place where we can be before the enemy uh, institutes his plan. And you know, at 7 p.m. in the district that I live in, last, uh, on Friday night, the, at 7 p.m., something took place where in five different locations in the same district of where we are, there was five different attacks, knife attacks, on, amongst young people, where nine got injured, one died. And that started at 7 p.m. God had us up early. I thank God for those who have been gathering and joining us in prayer. And I thought it's sad that one should die. But you know, when I looked, they said from different locations, they were all these people who had been stabbed, four even at one time, came into the hospitals to be treated. They were coming in. I want to say that we are living in a time where it's not a time for us to be getting involved in performance or doing what we want to do. We need to understand that in every situation, if we're following Jesus, walking in light of his word, being guided by his Holy Spirit, we will be ready. And how often do we hear uh, people say these words, get ready. You know, every, every day uh, we get ready. For one thing or another, uh, we wake up in the morning and we get ready uh, to greet the day. We get ready for breakfast. Uh, we get ready to go to work. We, our, our children, we get them ready to go to school. We get ready uh, for our afternoon meals. You know, we get ready to come back home again. We're always in the process of getting ready. You know, we get ready to meet, read our mail. We get ready to read, read the, uh, watch the news, shall I say. We get, we get ready to relax before we even get ready sometimes uh, for bed. We get ready for all different things. But you know, the one thing I, I realize, people are not getting ready to face and meet with God. You know, our, our whole daily getting ready often focuses only on the present. But you know, the truth is, we really do not know what will happen tomorrow or the next day or the next month or the next year. But I know in my heart as believers, we must get ready for the Lord's return. I, I saw a clip that was sent to me the other day and it was a, a woman who was... Um, came out of a prayer meeting and, and she was broken and, and just crying uh, as she saw the returning of the Lord and how many souls will be going to a lost eternity. You know, God eternal has granted us all it's an eternal future. And we've got to focus on that. In 1 Corinthians uh, 2, verse 9 to 10, it says this, However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by the Spirit. God has revealed it to us, saints, by the Spirit. I, I, I pray and ask, may the Spirit guide us as we strive to be ready for the Lord's return. You know, it tells us in the word of God, those in the dark, they face destruction. And if there's ever a time that we need to be equipped and, 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 and be thinking soberly all the time, that uh, we need to be declaring, declaring, let there be light. Those who are in the light have deliverance. And we are light bearers. We are meant to be bringing the light to those who are lost and dying and in darkness. But you know, the Bible clearly says that those who are living in the dark, they face destruction. And uh, Paul makes it very clear when he writes to the believers in Thessalonica. He, he, he's telling them, and you know, Thessalonica was not a small place, it was a large city. And I understand at the time there's about 200,000 people. When we go back to verse 1, Paul calls them brothers. 
uh, th th these are people he's speaking to who are united by their faith in Christ their Savior. If there's ever a time as Christians, we need to be united in our faith, believe in the same thing, and, 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 and acting upon the, the thing that we believe. You know, what Paul is teaching to, to those there in Thessalonica, he's teaching them about readiness, readiness for Jesus' return. You know, uh, he even speaks in verse 1 to 3 about the suddenness of Jesus' coming. And we don't know the day nor the hour, but we know he's coming. But we also should be ready if he calls. It says, but concern the times and the seasons, brethren, in verse 1 to 3, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For it is written, it says, peace and safety. Then sudden destruction comes upon them, it says. Oh, God help us. As labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. You know, verse 1, it clearly says, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. Now, I know that Paul, when he's writing to the Thessalonians, uh, Thessalonians, he knows clearly that they have been taught about the return of Jesus and other prophetic matters. And I think about us as the church for years. I've been a pastor now for over 30 years. We have been teaching the word of God. We've been admonishing people. There are many that are not here today. They've gone to be with the Lord. But thank God they could be in right standing through what they were taught. Paul taught them about the times and the seasons regarding the return of Jesus. And so they had an idea of the prophetic times that they were living in. And they could discern the seasons of even their present culture. That's where God wants us to be. I, I, I thought it's so important that as we walk with the Lord and we hear from him and we have dialogue with him, we can know how to pray. How is it that we could be in the morning praying about the deaf spirit and in our very vicinity, we see that God, even in spite of the hearts of people, he could work. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. You know, the unexpected nature of the day will be a tragedy for the unbeliever. We're seeing the suicidal spirit coming upon young people. It's, it's, it's a tragedy. It's, it's unexpected for many. But God wants us to be in a place to be discerning. They will, will be lulled into sleep by even political or economic conditions. But they will be rudely awakened. We cannot fall asleep in this time. You know, they will hear the frightening verdict they will never be able to escape. And I just think about these who are getting lost. Satan, the thief, is coming to rob and steal and kill and destroy. It says, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And, and I thought about that phrase, labor pains. It, it, it suggests inevitably the unexpectedness, you know, when a woman's pregnant, she knows she's pregnant, but she doesn't know the time the baby will start getting into that position to come. And Jesus used this same idea in Matthew 24, verse 8. Let's look at that. He said, when he spoke of calamities preceding the end times as the beginning of sorrows, which is literally the beginning of labor pains. Oh, Lord, help us. You know, this whole idea, friends, is about giving birth uh, to a new age and implying an increase of intensity and frequency in these calamities. We can see that there's labor, we're in the labor pains. Things are intensifying. I mean, can you imagine nine different boys, one died on the spot, and nine different boys going to the hospital, all stabbed up as labor pains upon a pregnant woman you know, there's a certainty about that, my friends. There's a, a, a suddenly about that. Uh, there, there, it's, um, it's irre there's an irresistibility about the whole situation, and it's inevitable. In inevitability, of my words, I get twisted up, but you know, that's what I mean. It's inevitable, because, you know, we need to understand the coming of the Lord 
is going to take place. And I can see in verse 4 to 5, we can see the, the basis of why Paul here is exhorting and brings this exhortation. He says, but you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of the light, sons of the day. Hallelujah. Lord, we don't just want to say, let there be light. We want to be sons and daughters of that light. He said, but you, brethren, are not in darkness. Lord, will you help us? Because I see here, as the Apostle Paul is addressing their behavior, Paul first simply told the Thessalonians Christians that they should be who they are. We need to be who we are. If we say we're light, we need to be that light. God has made us sons and daughters of the light and sons and daughters of the day. Oh Lord, the time when we were of the night or of the darkness is in the past. Hallelujah. That's what we used to be. We're not in darkness no more. And I come against the spirit of death. And those that hear me today, every death threat against your life and your family life, I come against it in Jesus' name. We bring the thoughts into captivity. So now we simply have to live up to what God has made us. That is day. That is day, people, so that the, the day should not overtake us as thieves. Paul goes on here, and you know, when he's speaking, Paul means that they should not happen, this should not just happen for the believer who lives according to their natures as, a, as sons and daughters of light and sons and daughters of the day. We will not be overtaken, my friends. We will be ready for the return of Jesus. And we're not going to be with him alone. We want everyone that we know to come to know him. We want those that we know to be delivered from the power of darkness and sin. Oh Lord, will you help us, Father? Because I was look, looking in this and, you know, we've got to be ready. Paul is led from the consideration of the day of the Lord uh, to the thought that the Thessalonians have nothing to fear from the coming of of that day. I want to say this right now. We want to be in that place where we don't have to fear the coming of the Lord. We don't have to fear that day because we know whether he calls, comes or calls, we will be ready. We will be ready. I'm speaking to you right now. Those that are sitting on the fringes, those that are sitting right now on the borders of giving your life to Jesus Christ, do it now. Do it now. Today is the acceptable day, acceptable time for you to yield yourself to the Lord. There's so many who are gripped by fear and all they're doing right now, they want to know about prophecy. They want to know what's going to happen when. What They want to know what's going to happen tomorrow. They want to know about what the COVID is going to do. Listen, you stop whining about what's going to happen and you start putting yourself in a place where God's glorious work of salvation can happen for you. You know, Paul goes on to lead us to further thought that their lives should be in harmony with all that the day stands for. Father, we want to live lives that we can say this is the day the Lord has made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Why do we rejoice and be glad in the day the Lord has made? Because the Lord is rejoicing over where we are and how we are responding to what he has done in our lives. Lord, I just pray today that somehow we will have this urgency to understand that just like how we need to be ready for all other things in our life, the most important appointment we have is to be ready to meet the Lord. You know, in some respects, the coming of Jesus will be a surprise for everybody in some respects. We'll all be surprised because no one knows the day nor the, nor the hour. Because no one knows the day and the hour, as I said. But you know, in Matthew 24, uh, 36, it tells us that but for Christians who know the times and the seasons, it will not be a complete surprise. The Bible speaks about the tribe of Issachar, had an understanding of the times. I want to be someone that's not just praying over a situation because I get news that something's happened. We want to be there before it happens. We want to understand the times and we have the Holy Spirit leading and guiding us. No one knows the exact hour. 
a thief will come. But some live in a general preparation against thieves. There are those who have alarm, alarms on. There are those who have cameras. There are those who live watching and waiting and looking. So when the thief comes, they know before he breaks in. Those who are not in darkness, who live as they are all sons of light and sons of the day, these are ready for the return of Jesus. I'm living a time right now where it seems that performance in church and, and uh, having worship and having all these things is more important than people getting ready to meet their maker. But if we are in darkness, perhaps caught up in some sort of sin, Paul warned against this previously in his letter before, then we are not ready and need to make ourselves ready for the return of Jesus. We can be involved in all kind of church activities Activity and not ready to meet Jesus. We can be ready to perform before people in church and not ready to stand before our God. Verse 5, the latter part says, we are not of the night nor of darkness. Uh, hallelujah. Now we can see the comparison coming here. Those in the dark with believers who live in the light. There's a mixture. There are some that can be amongst people who would act like Christian, but they're still living in darkness. Verse 7 tells us clearly, that sin and evil abound in the dark. Wickedness likes darkness. Are you hearing me? Wickedness likes darkness. God will expose all. We're living in a time of exposure. When Paul gets down here to verse 6, down to verse 8, Paul, his exhortation comes, be awake, sober, and watchful. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. My friend, we see here clearly that Paul says, therefore, let us not sleep. It's time for us to wake up. Are you hearing me? It's not time for us to be in church just going through formality or tradition and singing Rock of My Baby. It's time for us to wake up because we do not belong to the night nor of darkness. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm calling those who've been lulled in to that position of falling back into darkness. I'm calling you out today in Jesus' name. Our spiritual condition should never be marked by sleep. Are you hearing me? I want to talk about sleep. We should not be marked by sleep. Spiritually speaking, we need to be active, my friend, and aware to watch and to be sober. Oh Lord God, it's a time right now of exposure. We are seeing the intents of people's hearts being exposed right now. And I'm saying, Father, we are not being called to sleep not sleep. Paul used a, a different word here. Uh, I saw when I looked into uh, uh, First Thessalonians 4.13, uh, death is mentioned. This is a different kind of sleep he's talking about here, there. But you know, the word sleep in this context is used uh, metaphorically to denote the indifference to spiritual realities on the part of believers. Look, do not fall asleep. Don't get it wrong. It's a different word than that used when we go back in chapter 4 before verse 13 to 15 for the sleep of death. This word here, it covers all sorts of moral and spiritual laxity or insensibility. And we are in a time right now where we can see this laxity and insensibility. People are moving away and just in a sleepy mode, not want to go by the things that make us alert in the word of God. Sleep speaks of so much that belongs to the world uh, and, 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 and the things that are in the world, but should not belong to Christians. Christians are never identified serving God in a, in a mode of sleeping. Sleep speaks you know, it speaks of ignorance. Uh, sleep speaks of insens insensibility. It speaks of, of a place of no defense. Sleep speaks of a place of inactivity. I'm saying, Father God, will you help us? Uh, for those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. You've not called us to be drunk, Lord. You've called us to be sober. And it's the opposite of spiritual watchfulness. 
in, if, if we're spiritually asleep. You know, God wants us to be alert. He wants to be sober. And he doesn't want us to be in a place for, where we are spiritually drunk and, and not conscious of what's going on. As Christians, we are of the day. Oh Lord, are you ready? And so we must watch to be sober. In my own life, I'm, I'm experiencing things, with distractions and all kinds of things. And at the same time, if you don't deal with distractions, you will never be able to deal with the things that are immediately taking place that God has ordained for you to be in a place to function. Put it on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, uh, the hope of salvation Paul uses in this, in these images of a soldier's armour to illustrate the idea of our watchfulness. You know, in Ephesians 6, he talks about the armour, but this here is about being watchful. A soldier is a good example for us today, friends, of someone who must watch and be sober. And he's equipped to do that with what he should do with his armour. I don't just want to have the armour. I want to have the armour and have it active and useful. We don't just want to be dressed up. We want to be functional. If you go down to verse 9 to 10, we see the security that's in for our future, my friends. We have a secure future in God. And I thank God for that. It says there, for God did not appoint us to wrath. I'll oh, say amen, somebody. When I look at where I'm coming from, when I look and see that, that what's deserving for the sin I've committed, I, I, I thank God when John saw his cousin Jesus, he didn't see him as his cousin anymore. He said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin. We say sins. No, it was not plural. The sin of the world. Jesus ultimately took on the sin, got a hold of sin and crushed the power of it. It says, for God did not appoint us to wrath. And that's why, because of what Jesus has done, we are now not appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Hallelujah. The only time I see that we talk about the believer sleeping is when they have gone into their rest. And we see that in the foregoing chapter when Paul is speaking to the church there at Thessalonica. I thank God today that we serve a mighty God. Hallelujah. For God did not appoint us to wrath. There are some of you right now, you might just need a praise break. When you look back and see where God has brought you from, you may be going through something right now, but when you look back and see where God brought you from, it releases an enthusiasm for the praise of God to break forth. Oh, because before we had had uh, the hope of salvation, we were appointed to death. Uh, before we could come and sit in church and not perform, but really came with true worship and adoration, we were appointed to wrath. Uh, but now, hallelujah, we no longer have an appointment with wrath. Uh, I thank God that we don't have to face him in his anger, but now we have obtained salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And and those of you who are parents and have children, we need to understand that when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, your household had the opportunity to meet and come before a loving God. You know the word wrath, it's important to understand that Paul means the wrath of God. God. We are saved from the world, the flesh and the devil. Get ready, get ready, get ready. We need to get ready. Are you ready? We have been saved from the world, the flesh, and the devil. But first and foremost, we are rescued, hallelujah, from the wrath of God, the wrath that we deserve, hallelujah. Paul speaks in this context here to believers, uh, that, to encourage them, remember what you've been delivered from. Remember you've been delivered from the wrath of God. Our appointment to wrath was appointment in, in two ways. We were appointed in two ways. First and foremost, when we look and we see in Romans uh, 5, 14 to 19, 
because of what Adam did to us and the whole human race, we are appointed to wrath. But I thank God, secondly, we see because of our own sin, we can't blame our sins on Adam. We've got, we're accountable for our own sin. We're appointed to wrath because of our own sin. But I'm standing today saying, Lord, I thank you that when Jesus died on the cross, he stood in our place in, in our appointment to wrath. And he, oh, hallelujah, glory to God. What did he do? He rescheduled us with an appointment to obtain salvation. Can you imagine we had an appointment to death and to wrath? But Jesus rescheduled our appointment. And as believers, when we think we are appointed, to wrath, we show up for an appointment that was cancelled by Jesus. Do you know I don't know about you? And you say pastors, why do you get so worked up? I am worked up because I'm on my way to heaven. I had an appointment that would be all about judgment and being cast into hell for eternity but Jesus came and rescheduled my appointment and he can reschedule yours today. He died for us and the idea is that Jesus died in our place. Oh, hallelujah. I need to praise him right now. Not simply that Jesus died for us in the sense as a favor for us, but that he died as a substitute for us. Give him praise right now. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. Paul put two interesting ideas side by side here. Hallelujah. Appointed, uh, appoint. It, it, it emphasizes God's sovereignty. Uh, uh, but obtain is a word that emphasizes human effort. He didn't just, Paul is saying that Jesus didn't just come and do it, uh, hey presto, but it took human effort. Together they show that the full scope of salvation involved both divine initiative and human effort. Whether we wake or sleep, we shall live together with him. Lord, I want to say right now, for those of you that have accepted the fact that you've received this gift of salvation, and those of you who have not, I thank God for this Bible. And when I, more and more when I think about it, you know, it's really, really strange. You know, we have to listen to the voice of God. We have to listen to what God says. I remember when I came out of hospital, it, I, it, there are things that sometimes that can be said and to you that if you don't know the Lord for yourself, you need to know who you are in Jesus. You need to know your purpose for being here. And I want to say this right now. I want you to get ready. Get ready. Live in readiness. Live to meet your maker. And you know what will happen? That will mean that every day of your life you will see productivity. You will be giving God's Holy Spirit room to work in your life. The word that you take into your life will become active and powerful if you're living in a state of readiness saying Lord here I am father whether you come or call this day belongs to you God you gave me this day I'm saying Lord I want you to be in every second every millisecond of my day I want you Lord to lead and guide you uh, guide me father I want you to take my hands my eyes my ears I want everything about me I want father everything I do to bring glory to your name if you're listen to me today and you've heard this message it's time to be ready you know we have a long time to get ready but it's time to be ready are you hear me mothers and fathers if you have children listen to me the same way that you get their meals ready the same way you get them ready for school the same way that you get them ready for all other things in their lives young people that are studying the same way you prepare yourself for exams the same way you prepare yourself to go and look for a career you need to understand you need to get ready you need to get ready because I want to tell you this thing there's so many things that people are preparing for that they are never ever going to see fulfilled but I want to tell you something right now uh, in Amos it said prepare to meet your God prepare to meet your God before any other thing that you do in your life the 
paramount thing that you should be prepared for and make your priority is to be right with God, to be right with God. You know, after a soul has left this earth, there's nothing we can do to pray for that soul. I see all this uh, religious nonsense of people going to pray for the dead. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the time where we say, Lord, I want to be ready. Now I want to give you an opportunity right now. If you know you're not where you should be, if you're looking for some praise and worship to boost you up, listen to me right now. The early church never had praise and worship bands. They never had all the facilities we have. And sometimes what we do is forget that the facilities we have is a means to an end. What you need and you should desire is to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ as your person personal saviour and know that whether he comes or call, whether sickness come, whether problems come, you will know that because you're with him, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Let me pray right now. Father, I thank you for your eternal word. Lord, today the message of Lord God, a hell to shun and a heaven to gain is been coming almost obsolete But Lord, right now, I pray for the souls that hear this message today. Lord, I pray let there be light. I pray for that person who has been deluded and deceived and think that they can put off their tomorrow. Lord, I ask you right now that you would unyoke us from every influence Father, God of the enemy that has deceived us right now in Jesus' name. It's amazing, God, those boys that were wounded, they knew to get themselves, Lord God, to the hospital. There are those, they said, that their wounds were not on to death, but there are those that they're fighting for their lives right now that are critically wounded. I pray, Father God, that Lord Jesus, that you'll do something in the ears of the hearers right now to understand that God, hospitals cannot give us life. Only you can. So Lord, may we run to you right now from where we are in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, right where you are. If you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died to save you from your sins, you can ask him for forgiveness of your sins. Be willing to repent, which means turn away from the things that you have known that the Holy Spirit has convicted you that is wrong and say, Jesus, uh, please uh, forgive me and set me free. I'm sorry for for the sins I've committed, and I want to accept you as my Lord and Savior. And today, Lord, I invite you to come in to my life. Oh, Lord, I accept right now that you've heard my prayer, and you've accepted me. And now, Lord, I want to walk with you as a child of God should, in Jesus' name. Amen. For those of you that are wondering and you want to be in a place because you want your friends and your loved ones to be in a place to be ready to meet the Lord. In the year 2000, my first visit to the underground church in China, when I came out of there, I had to, I knew I had to. After working down in China and see what was going on, thousands were coming to the Lord. But what happened was there was no one to disciple these people because they were all, many of them were just young converts and there were a lot of false teachers going on. I came out and got impressed upon my heart to put together a manual and it was called, I want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. After doing that, in English, I heard about, I went to a place called Mamants, right up in northern Russia. And when I went there, and they told me that most of the men die under 50. Uh, it, it got me, and they said most of them die without knowing the gospel because the communist stronghold was still up in that, really strong up in the north. And God put it upon my heart to print 3,000 copies in Russian of that same book and get them out. I got word back after that was translated that within the first, I think it was two months, in the maximum secure, secure 
prison, 21 prisoners on de not death row, they had life, had lifers, gave their life to Jesus Christ when that book was taken into them and given them in their cells. Uh, there's a passion in my heart. I know that those of us who are just, just want to have entertainment in church, just want to have a good time and missing the point, I want to tell you something right now. God has not taken me in to the most adverse places in my life as a young man into Haiti to see the powers of voodooism and what evil does to people when it grips them. He never took me into China and to Africa and these different places where people don't have the privilege we have, but yet still still have a heart and a passion for Jesus Christ because they understand what it is to be in darkness. The false light that the devil has brought over United Kingdom where people think they're in the light when they're in the darkness is being broken right now and it will come through the preaching of the gospel. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Equipping the saints, reaching the lost, WWMF We invite you in We welcome you in WWMF Equipping the saints Reaching the lost WWMF We invite you in We welcome you in WWMF in the saints, reaching the lost, W W.